On September 15, 2000, a teenage couple out for a stroll through Long Lake Regional Park in New Brighton, Minnesota, stumbled upon the remains of a woman in a swampy area of the park. She had been outdoors for several months, resulting in the mummification of her remains. The Caucasian woman was estimated to be between 25 to 50 years old. She stood 5 foot 5 inches tall with strawberry blonde to red medium long hair. There was no clothing remaining, but one white tennis shoe was located near the body. The cause could not be determined due to the level of decomposition. However, investigators believed someone had taken her life and she had possibly been stabbed. Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension collected DNA material from the remains back in 2000, but it did not match any missing persons in their database at the time. Despite a plethora of leads, investigators were unable to identify her or the perpetrator. The case went cold. In 2011, Detective Gary Sykes with the New Brighton Police Department had this to say about the case. He remembered the 911 call that September 2000 afternoon. He investigated the case back then and was still investigating it in 2011. A lot of work over a lot of years, and we are really no closer now than we were back then. He has compared her to some 350 missing women. He has examined dental records and every other lead that has come in. Any case where you cannot get to the conclusion that you want to get to is tough. I think that there is somebody who knows how she got there and what happened to her, said Sykes. She deserves better than what she has got. The couple that found the victim recalled that day. They are Jennifer Leach and her husband, Nathan. We both at the time said, it's a body, it's a body, it's a body. The two were in high school that September day. Rollerblading through the park, they rolled up on a shoe, still tightly tied, and no one was around. It seemed really odd. It did not add up to us, said Nathan. They walked up a nearby deer path, and that is when they found the woman's body. Finally, on September 15, 2023, the New Brighton Department of Public Safety announced that they have learned the identity of the woman in what was now a 23-year-old cold case. The identity of the woman has been revealed to be 40-year-old Gail Marlene Johnson. At the time of her demise, investigators believed she was last known to reside in Minneapolis. Investigators began working with Astria Forensics and built a DNA profile in order to establish a family tree. Using this profile, the DNA Doe Project and investigators were ultimately able to establish a genetic connection to Gail's family. Investigators obtained a DNA sample from a family member and confirmed the genetic familial connection. New Brighton Public Safety Director Tony Patsnick said, It has been 23 years and we never gave up on finding out who this woman was and what happened to her. Identifying her provides an important new clue as we continue our work to determine the circumstances of her tragic end. Investigators urge anyone who knew Gail or had been in contact with her prior to her slaying to contact the police department at 651-288-4141. On July 20th, 1995, Police in Atlanta, Georgia found an unidentified man along the I-75 with severe injuries from what they believed to be a hit and run. The man was taken to Grady Memorial Hospital. Nearly a year later, on June 24, 1996, he succumbed to his injuries. The Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office ran his fingerprints in a national database. However, there were no positive results. 
Sadly, the case went cold. Now, thanks to the persistence of the medical examiner's office and technology from the FBI, officials positively identified the man as Stephen Shelton on September 11, 2023, nearly 30 years after his life was taken. The FBI credited senior Fulton County medical examiner Jimmy Sadler with reaching out to inquire about the changes in crime-solving technology. Brian Johnson, FBI lab official in Quantico, said, Without him reaching out and saying how about a little more, we would not necessarily do a deep dive for Fulton County. So again, it is a great team effort and Jimmy's tenacity to keep going. In this case, we have a new tool that allows us to resize the fingerprints a little to be more accurate. How it would have been the size before they perished, Johnson explained. Jimmy Sadler said, It is always a rewarding feeling when you can help identify a person. We work hard here with their family in mind. We are thankful for the new technology and work of the FBI in Quantico, Virginia. Sadly, Despite a detailed sketch and distinguishing tattoos of a serpent, dragon, and the word Virgo, no one has come forward to claim Shelton. Investigators now hope someone will come forward soon so that Shelton can have a proper burial. Some mother sitting on a sofa hoping her person would come home, Johnson said. Something of that nature. That is why we have the drive to do this. Anyone with any information regarding Shelton's family's whereabouts is encouraged to contact the Fulton County Medical Examiner. On September 14, 1974, two people were off-roading when they found human remains belonging to a male on the side of a trail in Aliso Viejo, California. The man appeared to have lost his life a few days before being found. The incident was initially ruled accidental due to alcohol and diazepam intoxication. In 1980, investigators found other deceased men that lost their lives due to alcohol and diazepam intoxication. They noticed a pattern and believed foul play could be involved. Confirming their beliefs, over the years, the bodies of multiple young men were found throughout Southern California. Some of them were found near where the 1974 John Doe's remains were located. In May 1983, Randy Stephen Kraft, later known as the Scorecard Slayer, was arrested for taking the life of a California Highway Patrol officer conducting a traffic stop on Kraft. There was a body belonging to a male victim, later identified as Terry Lee Gambrell, in the front seat. There were several empty beer bottles and an open prescription bottle of lorazepam tablets at his feet. In the trunk of Kraft's vehicle was a coded list of his likely over 67 victims. In May 1989, Kraft was convicted. Now 78 years old, he remains incarcerated at San Quentin State Prison. The 1974 John Doe has long been thought to be an early victim of Kraft, but for so long he remained unidentified. Despite attempts to establish the victim's identity, he was interred at El Toro Memorial Park in an unmarked grave. In November 2022, investigators began using genetic genealogy to try to identify John Doe and eventually found relatives in October 2023. The victim was identified as 17-year-old Michael Ray Schlicht of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The teenager loved warm weather, according to his family, and was known to hitchhike. His family members requested privacy and planned to install a headstone to mark his final resting place. 
Investigators with the Orange County Sheriff's Department explained that they enlisted the help of Othram Laboratories in 2022. They developed a DNA profile based on the victim's tissue samples and were able to identify his possible grandparents. That couple's granddaughter told investigators she had not seen her 17-year-old brother Michael since April 1974. Investigators received a DNA sample from a woman believed to be John Doe's mother, which positively identified the victim as Michael Schlicht. Even though it is believed that Randy Stephen Kraft took Michael's life, police continued to investigate the case. Anyone with information related to this case is encouraged to contact Orange County Crime Stoppers at 1 855 tip occs or crimestoppers.org. In May of 1976, teenage boys found the body of a woman in Sessions Creek off of Potter Tract Road in Mobile, Alabama. The woman had been shot in the back of her head. Her hands were cut off and she was wrapped in trash bags and dumped in the water. One of the teenagers that found her said, Even though I was 14 years old, it freaked me out that bad. I had to sleep on the floor in my parents' room. Until 2023, nobody knew who the woman was that lost her life in such brutal fashion. Her case sat cold for nearly 50 years. In 2022, the Mobile County Sheriff's Office released a new sketch of what she might have looked like. They hoped somebody would recognize her. Nobody did. But then, despite her body being cremated and placed in a mass grave with others, Sergeant Johnny Thornton found a dental mold in her file that still had some skin on it. That DNA was sent off to a lab and a profile was created. Using genealogical research, cold case specialist Olivia McCarter was able to link a family tree to the woman and ID her as 62-year-old Ada Fritz. Olivia said that Ada never had any kids. Her only living relative is a nephew who lives out of state. Olivia said Ada was likely visiting Grand Bay on a fishing trip because she liked to fish and hunt. Ada was originally from Oregon. It is unclear why her life was taken, but the sheriff's office thinks they know who did it. Henderson Williams is accused, but he is not talking. He passed away in a Mississippi prison in 2008. Henderson was convicted of taking the life of his own mother. Detectives said Henderson cut off his mother's hands and dumped her in a body of water in Grand Bay, too. Deputy J.T. Thornton said, I exhausted every possible lead I could find to put Henderson James Williams with this woman. He was not alive anymore, so I could not interview him and there was some uncertainty about where he lived. But the victimology, the hands cut off, the missing dentures, the location where the body was dumped were nearly identical between Williams's mother and Thornton's Jane Doe. Thornton also learned that Williams had taken the life of someone else in Newport News, Virginia in 1973, but only spent 28 days in jail. I called up there to that agency in Virginia, and they could not find anything from that case file, Thornton said. They said it was likely lost in a flood they had a few years before I started digging into it. Ada Fritz is now known and remembered, thanks to Thornton, McCarter, and a team of investigators, researchers, and scientists. On April 8, 1985, the remains of an unidentified individual were located in Fairhaven, Massachusetts, along Route 195. A driver stopped in the breakdown lane and found the remains in the brush nearby. 
the Fairhaven police responded to the scene and determined that the remains were that of an adult male, estimated to be 5 foot 9 inches tall and likely in his 30s or 40s at the time of his demise. Investigators believed that the man had lost his life one to three years prior to the discovery of his remains. Along with the man's remains, investigators recovered spent projectiles and the remnants of clothing. The evidence at the scene supported the theory that someone had ended the unknown man's life. Over the years, investigators pursued various leads and avenues to determine the man's identity. Details of the case were entered into the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, Name Us. A forensic cast was created to depict how the man may have looked during his life in hopes that it would help to generate leads about the John Doe's identity. With no other clues or identifying documents available and few leads to pursue, the man's identity could not be determined and the case eventually went cold. In 2022, the Massachusetts State Police, working with the Bristol County District Attorney, submitted skeletal remains to Othram in the Woodlands, Texas. Othram scientists successfully developed a suitable DNA extract from the skeletal remains, and then used forensic-grade genome sequencing to build a comprehensive DNA profile for the unidentified victim. After successfully completing the process, the DNA profile was delivered to investigators who worked with the FBI's Forensic Genetic Genealogy team to generate new leads in the case. With these new investigative leads in hand, the law enforcement team made contact with a potential family member of the man. Confirmation DNA testing between the potential relative and the DNA profile developed for the man established the identity as Keith Olson of Rhode Island. Keith, born May 13, 1953, was reported missing to the Cranston Police Department by his family in April 1981. He was 27 years old when he disappeared. With Keith now identified, investigators have also identified a likely suspect in the case. They said Keith had been dating a woman and that there had been friction between one of her old boyfriends and Keith. That man was later identified as John Broccoli of North Providence. A witness to Keith's disappearance described the two men escorted him from his Cranston apartment, the DA's office said in a statement. On the same day that Keith was last seen, Broccoli made cryptic statements to the woman who had been dating Keith. These statements suggested Broccoli's possible involvement in this matter. Broccoli was also known as Michael Corleone, the same name as the fictional character from The Godfather, according to authorities. Broccoli passed away in 2019 at the age of 63. The district attorney said the case shows the need for better coordination, not only between counties, but between states. So they are asking anyone with a missing relative to call police and provide a DNA sample that can be compared to thousands of bodies that are still unidentified. Anyone who might have information in the Keith Olson case is urged to call Massachusetts State Police Detective Lieutenant Anne Marie Robertson at 855-627-6583. The investigation continues, and the hope is that more updates will be made public as they become available.